thank you thank you madhu uh, president ragab uh, dr carl walters ivan merils daniel guru paul byrens damian pearson and brand wards and my other colleagues it's indeed a very uh, very great pleasure that we have a webinar on a very important uh, irrigation uh, automation of irrigation systems uh because nowadays uh, with the expanding irrigation systems and with decreasing amount of uh, skilled manpower that is available to irrigation managers the automation has become a very very important topic uh simultaneously the demands of water are continually changing and for that changing the policies in a on a quick and a ready fashion is also becoming sometimes difficult if you have a completely manual system as we have been finding thirdly with the with the kind of extent of spread the maintenance and management of the systems especially finding the faults or locating the faults in time and then uh, you know in pre preparing for the repairs or for the rehabilitation parts of it again there the automation helps a lot as we have seen in one of our icid whatsapp award cases that uh, by collecting the data through semi automated means helps a lot there are a lot of uh, technologies available uh, and many of the technologies look a lot of give a lot of promise when we look at them in the in the field and in the in the uh, in the large scale prototype but then when it is applied to the actual systems on the ground sometimes the expectations change and sometimes the outcomes change and there a lot of experience from the automation uh, field as well as from the irrigation operators field have to come together australia has been a pioneer in in the irrigation automation we have been uh, learning about australian automation systems since a very long time at least last 20 30 years and uh, these automation systems have performed very well in australia so it's a, it's a very useful uh, experience for all of us to know what way these systems were designed what were the what were the issues that were handled at the time of design and then at the time of planning what were the experience that were gathered so we have a very very good and very excellent uh, um, panelists here today who will be coordinated uh, by dr carl walters uh, from the iacid side and uh, we will be we, we are very sure that uh, the same the participants will reap a very rich harvest <clears throat> as far as the knowledge on automation systems and the experience actual field experience of handling them is concerned so i am very happy that i am also part of this seminar and uh, i would uh, also our president ragab is also here with us and uh, he has made it a special time so we would like to hear a few words from professor ragab and then we can start the webinar right. first of all i would like so to professor to... ragab please okay thank you uh, first of all i would like to to thank uh, the uh, that the speakers uh, for dedicating their time and, and really to to let us know learn more about the australia experience and such such successful story uh, and that would help actually uh, us a lot to better manage water and i think the subject is really very important and uh, I'll, I'll, and actually cross cutting of so many working groups activities so all the working group activities will actually Uh, uh find something uh, related to and and all members of icrd will also find some information and knowledge uh, to be gained from this uh, webinar i i would like to to thank you uh, all again for really dedicating that time and your knowledge and sharing your experience uh, with all icrd family thank you very much and uh, i'll let you ready to to uh, to make uh, your start thank you very much Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, Professor Re President Regab, uh, and it's uh, it's nice to have you have you here with us all. Um, so my name's uh, Carl Walters. I manage uh, a sustainable irrigation program here in Australia. I'm also a director of Irrigation Australia as well, and, and a member of the um, uh, ICIAD, um, the Australian Committee for Irrigation Drainage, and, and have been for a number of years now. Uh, so tonight we've uh, got four um, four speakers from uh, from Rubicon and from Melbourne University, and um, and really I suppose Paul, you're you're a practitioner from um, from Southern Rural Water and elsewhere, but you've experienced the change that we're going to That's talk right. about. Um, 
So I'll introduce you, you guys in a second. Um, so what our, our plan is is to uh, to start. Um, we'll have four speakers. Each one, each of you will speak for um, about fifteen minutes or so. Um, we'll take a couple of questions after each each presentation, and then we'll have a time for a panel session at the end of that of that um, of the presentation period. Um, so my role essentially is to um, to field the questions, um, to to shepherd us to the end, and then uh, then manage the panel at at the end of it. Uh, hopefully, we successfully um, have a successful sort of webinar, and uh, and people can get gain some knowledge from the experience of the four speakers because they're very experienced and um, and had a had a significant role in the changes we've been experiencing in Australia over the last last twenty years. I think particularly. So tonight's webinar really is about um, talking about the change that we've experienced in Australia due to, as Professor Ragab described the, uh, earlier, the, the dry conditions we, we have um, and the experience we've had with uh, identifying that a lot of our losses out of our, our open channel systems uh, can, be, can be managed and can be improved through automation. And tonight is about auto, the automation story if you like. And um, one of the leaders in that has been Rubicon and, and they've been part of the development right back from the start of automating channel operations or canal operations, and then allowing that to be feed through to farms and allowing then farmers to grow more product with less water and, and, and maximizing what we do with our limited resources in Australia. So hopefully, hopefully that introduces what we're about tonight um, or, or to wherever you are in the world, but it's uh, late in the evening in Australia. Um, so, first up, we have uh, Damien uh, Damien Pearson from Rubicon. Damien is is the uh, I'll find your title. You're the global business development manager from Rubicon Water. Uh, worked in many countries in the world, but you can introduce yourself as part of your presentation, um, and uh, and tell the story about uh, Rubicon and what you're about, and then we'll we'll lead on to the other speakers if if you're comfortable to go. Yeah, thank you, Carl. I'll just um, I'll just get my screen up quickly, and uh, then we'll uh, we'll get moving. So, look, thank you very much, to all the participants. We really appreciate you joining us. Um, uh, a bit about myself and about the company. So, so Rubicon Water, we're a, a global technology company, and and our focus is on um, improving water use efficiency and and the sustainability of irrigated agriculture. Um, I've personally been involved in irrigation in, in Australia for uh, just over 26 years now and uh, been fortunate, I guess, to, to live the experience of this transition of, of, of uh, modernisation and adoption of technology within the industry. And uh, I've certainly uh, seen a lot uh, and been involved in the, the transitions that have occurred in Australia, which have really recovered huge volumes of water and, and really done a lot to sustain agriculture. Um, now, as a business, um, so our, our real, uh, I guess, motivation and mission is to provide farmers with the ability to apply the right quantity of water to their crops um, when and where it's needed. And um, uh, Rubicon's uh, focus is really to improve the management of the supply systems to create a, a high um, quality of service on demand delivery system to sustain, to support farmers in their precise um, use of water. Uh, just a few quick metrics. So uh, the, the business has uh, been uh, working in this field for 26 years now. Um, we're operating in over 15 countries. We've, we've automated many thousands of kilometres of um, irrigation canal and um, they, they combine service well over one and a half million hectares of irrigated um, farmland. And along the journey, we've supplied more than 30,000 precision uh, flow control gates and, and metres worldwide. So um, I, I trust many of you are very familiar with the challenges involved in uh, supplying uh, surface water and, uh, and, and pumped groundwater to um, irrigated uh, farms. Um, and uh, it, it really is quite uh, a big undertaking to try to get water where it needs to be at the right time to meet the needs of users um, without waste. And um, 
The reasons are quite simple. Uh, you, you can only really perform to the level of the tools that you have available. And, and when you're trying to supply water through these irrigation networks with traditional manual uh, methodologies, um, you face a lot of challenges. So uh, obviously these, these canal networks cover very, very uh, significant areas and just the travel time uh, to, to, to visit each uh, control point within the network and, and make an observation, a measurement, a, a control adjustment. Uh, the, the sheer travel involved means that you can really only spend a very short period of time at each control point once, maybe twice per day. And uh, you may observe what's happening at that location within the distribution network um, with a point observation, a point data point a sample uh, at that point in time. But for the remaining 23 hours or so of the day where you're not on site and you don't have eyes on that location, it, it's really very difficult to, uh, to know what is happening and, and to make um, informed uh, decisions uh, on, on where to put water, what, what flow regulation points to adjust, etc. Um, obviously also we're supplying very large volumes of water through these distribution networks and what that means is that any, any mismatch between supply and demand can really translate to very large volumes of water that can be lost in these distribution networks. Um, as farmers adopt more precise uh, on-farm water application technologies uh, that are really driving precision agriculture, uh, their requirement for precise on-demand delivery of water through these distribution networks really does require very frequent um, controlled regulation adjustments throughout the entire network. And uh, again, with manual operation, it, it's just very, very challenging to make the required frequency of changes at all points to um, properly uh, match supply to demand. And the, the, just the reality of those constraints means that often it's necessary to impose, I guess, constraints on the flexibility of um, delivery of water to farmers. So you, so you may need to enforce a, uh, a rotation-based delivery uh, schedule or, or a, a, some other rigid form of scheduling to impose um, a degree of control that you can manage water orders through the network. And, and often those constraints are not compatible with, with optimizing the, um, the water supply to the actual water requirements uh, of the crops being grown. Um, now, even, even with SCADA systems, and when we talk about SCADA, we talk about traditional um, monitoring uh, over, over a telemetry network and, and at times uh, traditional sort of uh, site-based adjust control adjustments. It's, um, it's very difficult, uh, even, even with that SCADA technology, to make the correct adjustments at the correct time. So in these large systems, there'd be literally hundreds of decisions to be made every hour on regulation adjustments of various control nodes through the network. And uh, the burden of making those hundreds of decisions every hour, 24 hours per day, uh, seven days a week is really... Uh, what is driving the adoption of automation to improve the, uh, the distribution uh, precision within the networks. So uh, to alleviate that, that management burden and, and to make it workable, we, we, we rely on modernization and um, uh, modernization uh, generally involves improvements to the infrastructure to improve both the, what we'd call the quality of service to farmers. So the ability to provide them with the water volume that they require at the location and time they require it for the duration that they require it. Uh, but also um, uh, the ability to uh, uh, basically improve the distribution efficiencies throughout the network by precisely matching supply to demand. And uh, uh, automation is, 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 a, is, a, is a, a term that's used to describe that, that process of improvement. Um, but the terms modernization and automation, they, they really do mean different things to different people. And um, what we're showing on this, uh, this, this bottom um, uh, sort of scaled arrow here is, is, is what, some, what, what various interpretations of modernization and automation mean. And uh, I guess if we look on the left side of the area here, we have our, our, our starting point for the industry, which is uh, 
uh, you know, manual operations where we will have uh, people traveling by vehicle through regulation structures throughout the, uh, the irrigation scheme and uh, making uh, physical adjustments, maybe by turning a handwheel to uh, just a threaded stem, maybe by lifting a drop board or a drop log out of a regulation bay, so manually making adjustments through the network. At the other end of the scale on the right hand side, we have uh, fully autonomous operation and and that's what we will be discussing and that's what um, has led to the successful outcomes within Australia. So autonomous operation is a system where we rely on computing, we rely on software, we rely on telemetry and we rely on yeah, modern information technology systems to make decisions, uh, as I mentioned, hundreds of decisions per hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week to allow farmers to order water at any time that they may require, be it 3 a.m. in the morning and, uh, you know, for any duration they require, it might be for four hours and it might be for four days. But uh, we have an autonomous system that can manage all of that without human intervention and really alleviate that burden of this you know, data overload and decision uh, yeah, uh, burden that, that comes when you try to manage a system just through pure SCADA um, methodology. Now, uh, the, the, the pathway to hit autonomous automation, uh, and it is often a journey and it is often a pathway that's achieved in stages, but uh, initially you might choose to um, upgrade your system regulation points by uh, uh, equipping them with actuation. So you may fit an electric motor and you may fit um, local push buttons to allow operators to adjust, uh, make you know, precise adjustments. Um, you may also fit local instrumentation, but without any, um, without any uh, telemetry, uh, you, you may have an instrument there that you can, uh, you can uh, then utilize and uh, make adjustments via push buttons to uh, maintain maybe a flow set point. Uh, but um, uh, all the operation in, under that uh, configuration is, is performed on site. Uh, the, next, uh, the next level of advancement is remote monitoring where uh, often we refer to that as SCADA. And that's a very powerful tool that um, basically gives you eyes in the field. Um, you, you have your control room and you'll be able to monitor flows and water levels, uh, valve positions, gate elevations throughout the network. And uh, you'll be able to uh, free yourself from the requirement to travel to site to make those observations. So that, that can be a powerful labor saving um, tool. Um, uh, Bear in mind, though, that you may still be subject to business hours operations. So, um, with with, uh, with with human operators monitoring that data, um, the, uh, the the response and decisions that would be made from that information would typically be made in in business only hours. Uh, now, a slight advance on that is the ability to make remote adjustments with remote operation. But again, yeah, human decisions, human interpretation of data human understanding of how the hydraulics of the network uh, uh, work with, with regard to travel times, delays, time constants, et cetera, as water has to travel for days to reach a location. And all of that institutional knowledge might be in the head of one or two operators, uh, uh, and they may well know how to drive that system very effectively. But again, it's relying on, on, on their presence within the control room during business hours to make those, um, make those adjustments. So. Then we go to autonomy, which basically uh, uh, is a system that uh, has modeled and understands the hydraulics of water distribution networks, understands the travel times, uh, understands what changes need to be made throughout the network to supply water at a point in time, um, and can do that uh, with uh, very high decision resolution. We're, we're literally, literally talking hundreds of decisions per hour, in some cases hundreds per minute, um, uh, at all times, 24-7. So that's that's what I would call today, and you know, here we are in 2021, I, I, I would call that autonomous operation best practice global modernization. And when you were when you've uh, implemented those 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 best practice systems, um, this is a list of the benefits that accrue uh, from that investment. So um, we really find excellent service to farmers. 
which allows them to be very precise with their water application and therefore very efficient with their crop water use. So this enables farmers to receive water when their crop needs it. So effectively on demand supply. And I'll show you a slide in a few moments that goes into the importance of that. Um, now, water is equitably distributed throughout the network. So you, uh, you may be a farmer who's very fortunate to be up the very top of the network. Um, and uh, therefore, you'll be used to a high quality of service uh, being close to the water source. Uh, conversely, you may be in the very end of the network where you may have a different experience under manual operation. Now, when we've, when we've got an automated system which can precisely match supply to demand at all points equally through the network, no matter where your farm is located, uh, you will receive exactly the same quality of service as every other farmer serviced by that, um, by that delivery system. So it's, it's a great, um, of great benefit to uh, those farmers who have maybe suffered a, with, with stable supply, predictable supply, just due to the challenges of manual operations in the past. Now, the farmers will also receive consistent predictable flow rates through their farm service points. So in a lot of these systems, the farm service points are actually, they're flow controllers. They're not simply flow meters, but they're actual uh, dynamic flow controllers. And that's very important when you consider that the flow through a farm turnout can often be influenced by changes in the water level upstream of the turnout or or indeed changes of, of, of uh, the water level on farm downstream of the turnout. And if you're a farmer and you're trying to plan your on-farm irrigation around a consistent flow rate, and uh, unfortunately under past manual processes, you may not have received that consistent flow rate, it makes it very hard to be efficient on farm. So as soon as you receive a a constant flow rate controller to supply water to you, um, all of a sudden you can plan with great confidence and certainty your, your on-farm operations, which will allow you to achieve very high on-farm application efficiencies. Now, another great outcome of this um, auto autonomous operation of uh, the control of, of the canals is, is very high distribution efficiencies. So, um, in pre-modernised irrigation uh, systems in Australia, we would see under manual operations, we would see um, distribution efficiency, which, which is defined as the proportion of water that is supplied to farms as a fraction of that diverted, would be uh, generally 60 to 65%. Now in, in these modernised systems in Australia, we're, we're commonly seeing or distribution efficiencies greater than 90%. And some districts are now reporting distribution efficiencies of 95%. So basically their, their losses are really confined to evaporation and uh, uh, they've got uh, such tight control that with, with matching supply to demand and with accurate um, measurement and accounting that they're able to account for 95% of the water diverted as being uh, metered onto farms. And uh, to achieve that, um, you've got precise measurement and, and control of, of, of the flow at every control node or every, every regulation point through your distribution network. Um, you've got precise measurement everywhere. Uh, you can see exactly where your losses are occurring within the canal network and uh, your water usage is accurately accounted for. So, um, to achieve this, I'll, I'll jump quickly through this. So basically the message in this slide is that you need, you need automated technology, which uh, controls and measures the flow of water through the supply network to farms. And that comprises software, it comprises a wide area communications network and it, and it comprises um, precision measurement and control hardware. And you, you need an integrated approach to, to achieve these outcomes. And you, you really want to look at integration of the complete water de delivery system, it focused from the catchment all the way through to the root zone of the crop. And uh, in this diagram, we're, we're showing uh, a uh, canal system, which, uh, which is supplied from a diversion from a river that we've got a, a dam diverting from a river. Uh, the gravity uh, canal network is supplying water to farms. And we've got a farmer who's got the benefit of investment in modern on-farm application technologies. 
so if, if we consider, um, I guess, the process of delivering water to the farmer with this um, automated system. So the farmer has uh, now got a lot of data that he can use and a lot of sensing and science that he can use to inform him of his crop water uh, requirements. So in the diagram here, we can see he's got a soil moisture probe. Um, We've also got satellite crop sensing providing uh, crop coefficient data, uh, infrared uh, temperature information. Uh, in Australia, uh, we have microclimate um, high, high grid density uh, weather stations being deployed, uh, which basically provide uh, on-site evapotranspiration uh, measurements in basically in compliance with FAO uh, 56 or, or Penman Monteith. And, uh, uh, we're able to deduce through field-based measurements on site of the field um, what the actual crop water consumption is and therefore what the crop water use uh, has been and what the crop water requirement is. So the farmers are now uh, equipped with that knowledge and that, that, that data to, and that knowledge and, and with that, he's able to make an order for water um, for a precise volume at a precise time, as informed by the actual uh, soil moisture content and the crops uh, transpiration. So we can see in this event, he's uh, on the right hand side, he's, he's, he's making a water order uh, through his smartphone. Now that water order is um, transmitted through the internet to the irrigation district software, which will in real time confirm the capacity of the system to deliver that order at the time requested. Um, and it will then set about coordinating the precise supply of that volume of water at that time and flow rate to that farm. And it does that by transmitting um, flow adjustment commands to all of the regulation points within the canal network. Uh, so in this diagram, we have um, two uh, regulating structures in the center of the diagram. Now those devices are all connected by radio communications. Um, uh, they can communicate as in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion where they communicate with each other and they also communicate with the control center. So each each uh, regulation point has a lot of situational awareness. It, it knows how much demand there is that uh, downstream of, of its location within the network. And it, it also has an understanding of how much water is on the way. And uh, they can um, basically continually regulate in real time uh, in a coordinated sense to exactly uh, deliver the volume to the farmer at his location at the time requested. Um, the, the water arrives at the farm and uh, his, his farm supply point is a constant flow rate controller, which is uh, ensuring a constant uh, flow as required by his on-farm application method, which may be uh, sprinkler or it may be drip or micro. Um, and it really allows him to realize the full opportunity of his on-farm water savings investment. Uh, so that's one transaction. Uh, you can imagine in these large districts, we have thousands of these transactions all occurring simultaneously. And each of those orders is summed and aggregated and uh, uh, each of the regulation points adjusts in real time as those flow, flows start, change or stop throughout the system. So you can appreciate with those autonomous devices located at every regulation point throughout the network, each of which cooperates in a system-wide manner and each of which is making a regulation adjustment literally every minute um, with precise measurement. Um, we have very precise matching of supply to demand uh, for every farmer in, in the network. Now, that, what does that lead to? So um, it, it saves a lot of water. So um, prior to these systems, it was, uh, we were seeing a lot of operational spill either from the end of the canals or, or, or as in the form of runoff or deep percolation on farm. Um, now all of that um, surplus delivered water, which has been lost to um, productive uses is, is now retained in um, uh, upstream. And so we're making the most beneficial use of the existing water storages and, and basically making more water available for future beneficial use. Um, 
with a better supply service, farmers can be a lot more precise with their application and that allows them to uh, basically get more growing days into the season. So by being precise with their application, they, they will not waterlog the soil, they will not shut, shut down crop growth and, and they'll get a lot more yield um, using uh, less water. Uh, the, the water will be fairly and transparently distributed. Uh, so every farmer in these systems has a water account. Um, when he was on his phone, it was very similar to being on an internet banking site. He would place a, a, a debit of water and it would be delivered and it would be accounted and uh, documented. And that can all be bundled up and reported to state regulating authorities, etc. So a lot of transparency and equity and fairness in the system. Um, and with the savings of water available, we can move to higher value crops with greater certainty that we can get them through dry years. And uh, we can also expand the area of land to be cultivated. And we, we also give farmers the confidence, you know, with a, with a quality supply system that gives them farmers the confidence to make their own investments in on-farm um, application system improvements, which is what we've seen. So, now we'll just take a quick look at uh, an example of this uh, in Australia. So uh, all of Australia's large irrigation districts have adopted these systems. Um, the largest um, implementation is the, the Goulburn Murray Irrigation District in the state of Victoria, which um, I'm sure you all know is in the southeast corner of Australia. Um, now, if we go back to the turn of the century, so 1998, 99, um, these systems were not modernized and uh, they looked uh, like they did back in the 1940s. And uh, some independent um, before, uh, analysis was conducted by state governments and uh, independent auditors assessed that uh, in this particular system, about 29% of the water diverted was lost during transmission. And if we, if we, the analysis was conducted to find out, okay, where, where was that water being lost? And via um, a series of um, pondage tests, uh, weir flow measurements, et cetera, at the end of canals, uh, samples, uh, surveys indicated that about 45% of all the losses resulted from operational spills at the end of the canal networks. About 25% was measurement error. And you can appreciate that um, when you're accounting for the uh, proportion of water uh, coming onto farm, um, measurement error is going to have a big impact on those accounts. But also as a farmer, if you know that your um, crop water use uh, data is telling you you need a volume of water, it's very hard to apply that if you can't measure how much you're applying. So if, as a farmer, you want that measurement as well to be precise, to maximise your yield. And then um, the remaining 30% was attributable to seepage and leakage and evaporation, um, system filling and unauthorised withdrawals. Um, an interesting thing was that the precise measurement provided in real time at every regulation point through the network allowed the seepage and leakage locations to be identified through real time bondage tests. And so, um, only a small portion of the canals in Australia have been uh, have been lined. Most of them are, are, are clay lined, and uh, the the real time flow measurement shows where the losses are occurring. And finally, uh, due to the challenges of manual operation that we discussed earlier, the irrigators the, there were constraints that were necessary on the on the, on the water um, orders from irrigators. So it was necessary to implement a four day lead time on um, water deliveries. And so if the weather changed, if there was a rain event and you had lodged an order, well, unfortunately that was locked in, and that that was a big um, problem uh, for irrigators before this change occurred. So now we look at uh, what the outcome of that modernization program was. So um, this particular project, GMID, covered 400,000 hectares of irrigated land and it is on a 27,000 square kilometre area. Uh, so over 3,000 kilometres of canal was fully automated. Um, 15 dams are being monitored and controlled, 26 pump stations. Uh, there's a radio network uh, spanning 11,594 uh, control sites and, and telemetry sites. And uh, between all of those sites, there's 2 million data points being monitored in the system. 
And every year there's a billion time series uh, data points being received from those sites and decisions are being made upon those data points and uh, actions are, are resulting from those data points. So a million, a million, uh, sorry, a billion decisions a year are being made by the software that's coordinating this delivery system. And it's um, achieving delivery efficiencies greater than 90% in the modernized areas. So last October was a very significant month um, in that uh, there was a media announcement from the Australian government that announced that this modernization project was a, had, had realized and was achieving its water savings objective of 429 gigalitres of water savings each year. Um, and the adoption of this technology has really been, I think, uh, recognised as one of the most significant um, infrastructure projects ever undertaken in Australia when it comes to delivering water to farmers. And it's certainly had great benefits for our um, irrigated industry. And uh, we're now starting to see these advantages realised throughout the rest of the world. So thank you very much, Carl, and I'll, I'll hand back to you. Oh, thanks, thanks, Damien. And um, yeah, it's a... It's an interesting case study and, a, and one close to my heart. I've worked in the GMID for um, oh, nearly 40 years now, which frightens, frightens me. Um, but yeah, so I think uh, perhaps we'll take one question. I'm not sure the process to get a question uh, out of here, whether it's just on the chat. Um, it, it is under Q&A. I can't, I can't see anything. Perhaps perhaps we might keep going and we might save it for the panel at the end. It might be this way. There, there, oh, there, there, is a, there is one question. How the seepage is measured in canal? There is one question uh, from... Uh, in the uh, Alba Baran. Okay, I can give a very quick answer to that. So with, with measurement at every regulating structure and every offtake from the canal, we implement real, with the data provided in real time, we, we can do real time um, volumetric balances throughout the network. And basically we look at uh, the sum of the flows into a pool uh, and the sum of the flows out of the pool and the difference is regarded as loss. And uh, we know the diurnal fluctuations resulting from evaporation. So uh, we can drill down and, and, and basically identify what's likely to be seepage and leakage from that information. Okay, and uh, so the one other one, a copy of the presentation, I'm sure that can be made available after, after we've finished today. Um, all right, so we might move on and, uh, and save, save your, your thoughts and questions for, for the end, I think, uh, guys. Um, so next up, so thank you, Damien. Uh, well done. Um, it's, it's always interesting to hear about the, the story and, and really that Rubicon's role in the transformation of irrigation in Australia has been pretty significant. Um, so next up, we have Professor Ivan Murrells and uh, Ivan's... Um, kindly going to talk to us about the moving towards a fully autonomous system in irrigation. Um, Ivan is a, a director of the Centre for Research for IBM Australia, New Zealand, uh, but he's had a lot of experience uh, in other roles. He's currently a professor at the University of Melbourne and, um, and uh, he tells a great story. And uh, I think uh, you've had a lot of experience in a lot of ways. You, you suggested you could talk for an hour about this topic, but um, we might give you 10 or 15 minutes and, and see how we go. So over to you, Evan. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, as an academic, I can talk about as long as I want about any topic almost. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> quick, uh, I, I'm actually working for IBM. I work for Big Blue. Uh, I, you may venture that I'm not actually an irrigation uh, engineer. I'm actually trained as a systems engineer and I look at irrigation systems as a system and think about it as a system. But the work we are talking about here was mainly done in collaboration with Rubicon over a long period of time. Uh, we started in 98 uh, working together on this uh, topic of how to automate channels and systems of channels and then also looking at on farm and our first publication was actually published in the Australian National Committee for Irrigation and Drainage Conference in 99 with uh, actually a colleague of Damien uh, Carl Wendt at the time. So the, uh, what I'd like to talk a little bit about is 
the, the, the paradigm of measure model manage. You, you heard it from Damien. Uh, we want to manage water. We want to manage it with certain constraints. For that, we have to understand what that means. And hence, the modeling comes into play. And you can't manage anything unless you want to measure it. And so measurement is important. So hence, my paradigm is always measure out of the measurement, deduce the model from the model, then you can know how to manage it properly. And my approach is just to talk a little bit about the complexity of these systems. Uh, we know that they are civilization old in, in a way, uh, modern civilization is based on the premise of irrigation uh, that allowed us to have satisfied uh, communities. And uh, we knew how to do this. But at this point in time, we're actually finding many more constraints. And uh, in the introduction, Professor uh, indicated the difficulty of droughts and the difficulties of, of climate change that uh, are, are actually not persisting. And so it means that we have to meet the water demands, uh, competing water demands with much more uh, stringent requirements essentially. And that, that requires us to be more precise about it. Uh, one way of being precise about water is giving the crops their water on time as per the physiology of the plant. And uh, Dan Lu will talk a little bit more about how we can exploit that knowledge in order to time the water over a season very well for highest productivity. Uh, water, of course, has to be distributed responsive to local weather and soil moisture conditions, another thing that we should observe and, and measure. Uh, we think water measurement may be easy, but in the year 2000, there was actually no single accepted uh, standard for uh, volume and, and flow measurement in large scales. Uh, so it, it is hard to do this precise and timing it over a big region is not that easy and you actually need technology that is 21st century in order to be able to achieve that. And certainly our forefathers could not conceive about it. They didn't have to worry about it either because they didn't have the constraints. Uh, I always think about water as in, in, in limited supply despite the fact we have the, the, the blue planet. So there's plenty of water, but economically there's only a certain amount of water available. and the city, the agriculture requirement, the environment itself, all need to use that same water. And then hence, the only way for the moment we have to deal with that is to have kind of a water market that can moderate the access to the water as well as the price at which you can have access. And my main point of today is actually to talk a little bit about the size and the scales that are uh, important to consider when you wanna do a holistic approach to uh, water management. And uh, I've drawn here a, uh, an axis that will represent time. And I'm thinking about it in a logarithmic scale. So when I see number three here on the, on the scale, I actually mean a thousand years. And zero, I mean one year. And at minus eight, I'm talking about seconds. And on this time scale, I will try to present a little bit of the the concepts, the dynamics that are happening in the water environment that we have to take care of when we really want to manage water properly, taking into account all the dynamics of water. And surprisingly, uh, managing water, if you want to really understand it all, requires almost a concept of 18 orders of magnitude in time and about as many in space. So first, uh, up the water itself. And on the very fast time scale, if you really want to understand what we can start thinking about how molecules behave and you write down these Stokes equations and turbulence phenomena are happening at the size of the molecule, but surprisingly turbulence phenomena exist in water flows and channels up to size of kilometers and can be persistent over days. So that's the very fast dynamics, typically not dynamics that we're going to really worry about when we want to supply water to plants. But nevertheless, to understand how water behaves and moves around in a the channel, they're the equations that you normally would write down. The travel time on these channels uh, as well from a dam to a farm gate, if you talk about a thousand to 5,000 kilometer length of channel, you can talk about days to weeks that water actually takes the time to travel from a dam to the farm. And when you then also want to understand how the interaction works with groundwater, we have to consider that groundwater dynamics on a basin scale can be extremely slow. And in, in Australia, measurement expectations are that roughly it takes a thousand years for a drop of water to actually move from the top of the north of Australia to the bottom of the, of the, of the basin. So it's a thousand year dynamics essentially. Again, something that is probably outside of our scope at this point in time. 
the most important dynamics, the yearly hydrodynamic cycle, the plant physiology, the weather of the, on the farm are all of the hours to maybe a year, say a season in play. And that's really the focus on the irrigation is how do we do this season particularly well? When you look at the infrastructure that you plan, then infrastructure that is exist in existence can actually be up to a uh, well, thousand kilometers long, but uh, we still use channels that the Romans dug before Christ in Portugal and in other places like here in Australia, we have indigenous channels that are 4,000 years old that are still in use. And they're everywhere around the, the, the world. We have really old structures, some of which are still in use. So that's very long time planning. Farm planning, however, typically years, I would say, uh, and of course, duly daily scheduling as well. And the typical periodic scheduling of water is in the order of seasonal all allocation, but probably down to days and weeks for the known allocation time. When you start looking at how you do that in a data rich environment, when you present say, an internet of things approach to this as a whole systems approach, I've got here the red uh, lines incoming in. The measurements you may be surprised, but actually to measure water flow at a relatively high precision does require electronics working at a nanosecond, uh, yeah, minus 15, so micro, uh, better than microsecond scale. Uh, that's where we measure essentially. Uh, the modeling that we do for how these systems work Typically, we take into account minute time behavior up to monthly, up to months essentially. And all the modeling is done on, in an edge computing way in a decentralized distributed manner in order to understand how water moves, like Damien in, indicated, uh, that uh, we take track of the dynamics of, on, on every channel, uh, structure and channel essentially. The big difference that it makes to allow us to measure that fast is actually that we can now put control into place that regulates water flows and regulates water uh, levels to on a minute time by minute by minute time scale. And that is well beyond what manually is able to be done. And you can actually show by the time constants of the system that that's roughly the time scale on which you have to take action in order to maintain a uh, steady uh, supply and the main equation whilst also maintaining the, the quality of service, maintaining the levels in the channels uh, appropriately. And then you gather all of that information together and you probably have to do this over many years in order to got, start really to understand how the system actually behaves so that you can start optimizing for crop behavior as well as for optimization from economics point of view. And uh, I would say we're still much in our infancy in that space. So my whole point here is that Measure model manage, it works in a closed loop. We're using the data to make decisions at a scale that is across the entire system and in a manner that allows us to uh, optimize certain aspects. And the three different things come to mind in here. On the high time scale, I would say economic benefit is probably the most important one. Is how do you actually use the water that's available to get you the best return on investment? work in progress, but definitely an important consideration if you have the data about how plants behave and how water is used as an input and the other inputs as well, you can really start optimizing. And it's one of the most important questions I think the research is progressing in. Water allocation itself, so how would, if you stay within your supply availability, how can you actually manage the demand so that you get equity and, and certainty of planning, which is a really important thing for taking the risk out of farming essentially. And this has to be happening on a, on a catchment wide and probably over multiple seasons because you have to take into account how the weather and the climate change actually going to impact on your irrigation district. And then on the small time scales, we want to be able to give the farms what they need at the right time. So then we're talking about the controls on the minutes and we're looking over days and maybe a whole season to optimize the water distribution. And there the objective is simply precision, given the water allocation, given the economic benefit, what do we have to implement in order to meet the demand of the farmers so that they indeed reap the benefits that are economically available. I'd like to stop here. I know it gives us a bit more time back. Uh, if people want to look a little bit further, I would say, have a look at the Rubicon homepage. 
uh, there is a very nice piece of uh, work being done by the uh, Water uh, Future Economic Framework, 2030 Water, World Water Organization, uh, that, that explains the why, essentially, and why it's about economic uh, water shortage. Uh, I've got a, an hour talk uh, that you can watch if you want to, and I've given you a few papers here that explain some of the systems engineering principles that are behind the integration and taking us from the measurement through the modeling stage through the, the management stage of uh, systems. Uh, Italy and Australia has been the main example where we have worked in. Thank you, and over to you, Carl. Right. Thank you, thank you, Evan, and uh, and well done. And um, it's fascinating how much detail goes into trying to deliver water to a plant, isn't it? And uh, and make our system effective. Um, yeah. So we have uh, one question there already. Um, electronics can take nanosecond response, but mechanical gate cannot respond so fast. And how do we achieve the accuracy? Um, Yes, so it's true. The, luckily, the gates don't have to be that fast, but the precision of the electronics is required to be able to get the precision of measurement because in the end, we are using the shape of water in order to determine how fast it's flowing. And that has to be done with incredible accuracy. And hence, we need the high accuracy in the measurements. But for the gates itself, minute by minute is enough. And so they need to behaving on a, on a time scale that are several orders of magnitude slower, uh, but still extremely fast compared to what say manual operations would normally have been the case. But if you think about the channels and the size of channels, then the minute 10 minute time scale is quite a normal time scale to work on. And that is sufficient to achieve the precision of the level control and the flow control but the minute time scale is not enough for the measurement. Okay, thank you. Um, so we might we might uh, save a few of the other questions. I'm not sure how we're going to how we're going to filter uh, a dozen questions for each speaker, but we'll uh, we might address a couple on the way through uh, as we when we get back to the panel session. Um, so next up, thank you for the presentation, and um, I find it fascinating how much detail goes in this. Uh, so next up, we have Dr. Dan Liu uh, from uh, Melbourne University. Uh, Dan Liu has been uh, uh, working in a research associate in infrastructure engineering department at Melbourne University and, and really looking at using short-term uh, ensemble weather forecasting to help with our irrigation outcomes. Uh, and um, I think uh, I'll hand it over to you and, you're, and you've got a joint project with Rubicon at the moment, which is about how, trying to, to match their system with, with the theory you're, you're bringing from weather forecasting. So I'll hand over to you. Yep. Thanks, Carl. Um, so can you see my screen? Yep. Cool. Thanks. So um, thanks, Damien, for the comprehensive introduction on the, all the on the ground element of irrigation automation. And then even for giving us the big picture of the key info and consideration we need to run these automation systems. So my talk um, will expand more on one point even has highlighted on water use optimization. So my name is Dan Lu Bo and I'm a research associate at University of Melbourne. And I'm here to introduce this study between Rubicon and University of Melbourne, which uses ensemble weather forecast to inform um, short-term irrigation scheduling decisions. So, um, and just, Going back to the big picture, um, thanks even for the nice figure, but this is like a summary of the automation systems and uh, where different parts fit. And just to highlight where, my, where our study sits, um, it's really about the behind the scene operation, the um, providing information and doing the analysis to inform automated system. So um, we're spe specifically focusing on irrigation scheduling here. So um, the key job we're doing are to analyze data, to run models, and to um, then provide recommendations on all the um, on-ground operation decision-making stuff. So um, this study is part of a larger study, um, a larger project uh, supported by Australian Research Council um, and a collaboration between Melbourne Uni and Rubicon Water. So the entire project um, looks at uh, irrigation scheduling and forecasting um, more at a field scale uh, within a district. And then also um, uh, uh, across district benchmarking uh, 
uh, which is more about comparing how different farms perform on their water use. Um, and this specific study, which I'll be talking on today, um, focus on short-term irrigation scheduling. So when and how much irrigation water to apply. Um, and as the first sequence of this study, we are looking specifically on surface irrigation systems. Um, so these systems tend to be, uh, tend to need large volume of water with longer irrigation intervals. So when to add the water is really the critical problem compared to how much. Um, so this is very different to those uh, precise systems such as drip or sprinkler irrigations. So that, that's just one note to carry. Um, so the, the key aim of this study is to um, develop an analysis framework for evaluating different irrigation decisions um, with consideration of uncertainties in future weather. So um, put it in a simple word, um, the key question we're asking here is, how does the uncertainty in future weather, um, specifically rainfall here we consider, how do they translate to the risks in um, irrigation management outcomes? So um, we explore this question with a modeling study um, in which we use um, a crop model, EPSIM, and we try to simulate the, let me go back a slide, simulate the root zone soil water um, for a maize, for our study site, a maize field in Southeast Australia. So in this simulation, we're combining um, information from ensemble weather forecast for the future zero to nine days, and also different irrigation decisions to irrigate on day one, day two, all the way down to day nine. Um, we've, we've fit in all these combinations of possible weather and irrigation decisions um, with the model EPSIM, and then simulate the soil water condition. So these simulations then gave us, um, allow us to estimate the risks of um, either wasting water or stressing the crop. And then we use these risks to help assessing which irrigation timing, which decision is the best. So that's, that's the overall of our study. And to go into a bit specific about the, how the risks are defined, we focus on two types of risks of either stressing the crop or wasting water. So um, imagine this is the um, simulated soil water in the blue line. And then this, this red zone that, um, is really the nine day window of our simulation focus, um, representing a future nine day from any time point in the, in the season. So from, this, from using the ensemble weather forecast, we can get uh, a large number of different possible soil water outcomes in the future. And we look at where this soil water, um, where these levels are to inform the risks. So the stressing risk is defined by um, when the soil, when the predicted soil water is below a critical deficit. So um, we focus um, specifically on the number of days of soil water below this deficit, and also the amount, the actual deficit the difference between soil water and the critical level. And um, this critical level is defined as a theoretical soil water corresponding to a tension of minus 40 kPa, um, according to a local guide uh, of refill point um, by crop and soil type. And we assume this to be a constant value throughout time. Um, and in the future, we can in incorporate time variant refill, refill, refill point in an extension study. So that's the bit of, about stress risk. And also we look at the risk of wasting water. So that's coming from a out, um, two outputs from EPSIM um, called drainage and runoff. So these will in, inform us the amount of water wasted when we over irrigate. So um, the two aspects of risk are, are a good summary of um, how different irrigation options perform. This one is about under irrigation and the other one is about over irrigation. So now I'll show you some results. So basically um, we've been running this simulation um, throughout the whole season, starting from each day in the season for the future nine days. So we get lots of time windows um, where different types of risks arise um, in the future. So um, I'll show you three key 
three typical risk patterns we've seen and discuss the implications here. And the first risk pattern we see is um, that we expect both stress risk and wasting risk to occur in the future. So um, just to a bit of explanation on these plots, the left hand the left plot shows the number of days of soil water below the critical level. So that's the number of days under stress or stress duration um, for um, different irrigation decisions. If you irrigate on day one, day two, day three, all the way up to day nine. And the middle plot shows the stress extent. So the actual difference between the soil water level to the critical level. So that's indicating the actual deficit that we're having um, compared to the critical level. That's also plotted for each irrigation decision. And then the right-hand plot shows the amount of waste. So that's the sum of runoff and drainage um, as a result of irrigation. So that's also plotted for different irrigation timing from day one all the way to day nine. And then um, last point is that the box plot shows the uncertainty that we expect from um, the future weather. So that's just a collection of results from using all the weather, uh, weather forecast ensembles. So that's, we can think of it in a way of representing uncertainties in future weather. So the way we'd read um, into the results um, can be focusing on stress and waste separately. So in terms of stress, we can see that um, both the stress duration and stress extent are expected to, to increase if we irrigate on a later day. Um, and if we want to completely avoid any stress, we'd go with irrigate on day one, which gives us zero stress, stress days and zero millimeters of stress. And in the other aspect, waste um, is only produced if we irrigate on day eight or day nine. Whereas if for other days of irrigation, we don't have any waste. So this indicates that if our irrigation aim is to minimize both the stress and wasting risks, we'd go with irrigating on day one, because both risks are zero. Um, but in practice, the implication can be different because some growers may wish to stress their crop a bit. And this is specifically the case if, if we're early in a season and uh, the farmers are wishing to push the root zone a bit deeper. So um, all I wanna highlight with these results are, um, this is the information that the anal analysis framework provides and it can enable a grower to make flexible decision on like how much stress and how much waste they can tolerate or they want to create. And the second case of uh, second type of stress, sorry, risk we see is much easier to understand. So we don't have any stress risk expected in the near future, um, but we have some wasting risk. So um, that's a really easy solution. We just don't need to irrigate on any day within this nine day period. And thirdly, we have another type which we only um, expect stressing risk in the near future, uh, where no wasting risk is expected. So again, this. Um, if we want to completely avoid stress, we go with irrigating on day one or day two. But then it depends on whether um, the grower wants to create some stress, um, to wait for further, um, and then the uh, irrigation will probably go a bit later. So um, with, with the three different cases of risks, I uh, just want to illustrate that um, this analysis framework um, can provide some nice short-term summary of um, risk of stressing the crop and wasting water. So this can help farmers to, uh, to identify the dominant type of risks and um, to inform them about um, potentially the best irrigation decisions and also allow them um, to make some flexible decisions. So um, we, we are aware that um, there's some studies about irrigation scheduling optimization, but we thought this way would um, provide actually some more flexible options to the farmers because they can actually see what's going on and they can make it um, make their own choice. And lastly, I want to highlight um, another usage of our results. So this is um, actually how, how the results look if we combine 
the simulation for each day in the season to generate a whole season plot. So the different colors in this plot here represent the dominant type of risk we expect if we start the simulation from each day in the season. So we can see that um, for um, most days in the season, actually for about 50% of the season, we're expecting no risks at all for the future, for the future nine days. And um, then that's followed by um, the blue dots, which are representing risk of um, waste in the near future. And then we have about 15% of dot days, um, which we only expect the stressing risk. So um, once we overlay this point, um, so this is the um, a summary of the ensemble rainfall forecast for the future. Once we overlay this point on the rainfall and also the initial soil water capacity, we can really see how this type of risk vary um, along different periods in the growing season and also how they vary with such as soil water level. So we can um, analyze a bit more on what's driving those risks. Um, for example, we're seeing more stressing risk and also both type of risks when the soil water level is low. So that's an expected result because um, the, the soil is getting dry. And if, if this period um, is coincident with a period that we expect, expect high rainfall, then that's um, adding the probability of causing waste if we irrigate. So this, this full season results is just another way we can use this framework, um, which provides some different information. It's more about um, informing the farmers about which periods are critical throughout the season so that they should um, consider risks more carefully when making irrigation decisions. So um, as a summary, um, this study um, I presented um, is about a model-based analysis framework to simulate the risks associated with different irrigation decisions in the short term. Um, and a unique aspect is that we're taking account, taking into account the uncertainty in future weather using ensemble weather forecast. So this type of analysis framework allows us to evaluate different irrigation scheduling decisions. And um, with the results presented, I've illustrated that this framework can provide really useful information to support flexible on-farm irrigation scheduling. So farmers can make their own decision knowing what risks there are. So in the future, we'll look into further extend this study to consider more sources of, of uncertainty other than the weather, um, the future weather that we consider. So this can include um, such as obs weather observations, soil water levels, as we expect some uncertainty from both the modeling side and also soil water observations. Um, ET forecast, that's, that's a key element. This current, our current study only focuses on rainfall forecast. So ET is really critical because it drives the soil water depletion rates. So um, by allowing uncertainties in ET forecast, um, we have a more robust tool to represent the actual uncertainties on the ground. And also irrigation depth is the last thing because in the current study, we're assuming that for each irrigation, we fuel the soil to the field capacity. So um, that's because we're less focusing on the amount in this study. But with all this extension, we're hoping to develop a full uncertainty framework um, so that the similar information on the risks um, that I've showed before can be presented to farmers to help them making better decisions. Um, and also we, we're thinking about looking at longer time scales when comparing different decisions. So um, something to consider are the full season yield and water efficiency and how they feed back into the evaluation of um, irrigation decisions. So yeah, thanks for your attention and I'd like to hear any questions and comments. Thank you, thank you, Dan Lee. That's um, very, it's, it's interesting, and and, uh, and so while someone else is typing one, I've got one. Um, yep. So your the your simulation and, and the modelling, have you tested that with any of the progressive farmers that Rubicon deal with? Yeah. So this case study is actually one of our, the, our uh, partners through Rubicon. So we've so collected the actual weather data on his field and um, yeah, all the simulations with his field data. 
So I would imagine he's quite interested in this as part of his decision process. Yes, for sure. So once we polish up this work a bit more, we'll um, make a presentation to him. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Thanks. So while while other, we might maybe we'll move on to uh, to Paul sure. Paul to talk about the uh, practicalities of, of automation. I haven't, haven't had a, another question pop up. And um, and thankfully I found the Q and A area of the um, of of Zoom, which is helpful. By the way, um, so next up we have uh, uh, Paul Burns, who's fr from currently Packwork Consulting, but um, Paul's had a lot of experience in the implementation of uh, of uh, automated irrigation systems after a long a long career in um, operational side of channels and uh, and, and irrigation systems. So. Um, uh, I think I'll just hand over to you, Paul. But I suppose the, the discussion really is about that transformation, isn't it? And and the challenges and opportunities that it presents for the operators of the of the canal systems, and and what that then right. means. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm Carl introduced before a practitioner, so I'm on the other side. So uh, Rubicon provide the equipment. Um, so I'll be. I used to work for a, a rural water authority, which implemented this. Uh, I think I think you're sharing the wrong screen. On the screen, I'll swap around. Is that better? Yep, that's the one. Okay. Yeah, so we, so that's from the other side. So it's implementing channel automation and that's, so my career sort of spanned about 35 years. So I had 20 years under manual control and the last 15 years in, in the Water Authority dealing with channel automation. So that was not only justifying the projects, delivering them, but also these projects then trigger quite a big change in the business itself. So it's a, it's a really big transformation process that occurs once you put in channel automation. So just to give some background um, in the Australian context, I suppose, so in Australia, the, there's a really strong legal framework for water. Um, it's very, so all our water resources, surface and groundwater are all capped and by and large, most of them are measured. And Australia, because of we're a dry country, has been going through a lot of water fraud since the 1980s. And modernisation is one of the key parts of that reform process. The water is very scarce and, and increasingly valuable. We have lots of trading, so the value of water is very obvious um, now when it wasn't so obvious in the past. And the scarcity of water is really the reason why canal automation came up because really the uh, system was stuck with a performance from a lot of the systems are pretty old, 1920s and 1950s. So their performance is really limited by those original designs. The other features in Australia, I guess, all their big supply systems are run by water service providers. So they're organisations that provide that water and they operate and maintain the systems. The customers uh, own their own water and that's under that legal framework, they're allowed to own their own water. And importantly, they order the water. So unless they place an order, there is no water delivered. So they've got the full responsibility of ordering the water. And the water service provider then has their responsibility to deliver the water. The other aspect with Australia, they've gone through part of the reform process is to sort of, uh, the old concept of full cost recovery. So the pricing of water um, is full cost recovery. So the customers have to pay for the full cost. Having said that, these big modernization projects are sort of a once in a generation change. So a lot of these projects have been partly funded or significantly funded by government. Just moving on the next slide. That's one that was shared before. So. In terms of the channel automation, if you go out to see one of these projects, that top part of the slide is, is what you'd see on the ground. So the gates are the most obvious feature in channel automation. So they're self-contained, so the gate operates, it's got its own actuator, it's got its own power, and it's got lots and lots of monitoring gear on before. Damien was mentioning before how many measurements are taken. So there's lots and lots of measurement devices on them. And that's really important because um, <clears throat> I guess one of the things in channels, open channels, is measurement of water levels is really difficult because if you've got so much disturbances with wind, 
and just live action. So the gates are very sophisticated. Um, so they're in that little control box, um, it's got its own IT. So that system actually runs by itself. So even though it's all connected back to a central computer, uh, by and large, that's really there only to exchange information. It's not really so much for the general control. It can, it can bring in new orders and you can intervene if you want, but by and large, these systems communicate amongst themselves and, and operate that way. That radio communication, there's lots and lots of communication between each of the gates, between the gates and the outlets. And then there's a communication from those gates back to repeater stations and back to some central base. The other part of the system, uh, which did exist to a fair degree before these projects was as an ordering system. So most, a lot of the authorities were using Rubicon's ordering system. So <clears throat> that wasn't a big change for these projects. Plus there's SCADA and there's a data warehouse system. That these systems do generate lots of data. So data management's a, a really important aspect. So just, I guess, why would you consider automation? So I guess when I joined the, the water industry, there was always, you know, performance was pretty much plateaued. And there was always a view that um, there's a tension between good service delivery and being efficient. So the view was, if you want to improve service delivery, you start wasting lots of water. Conversely, if you try to be really efficient, you're gonna give really bad service. So you end up with this situation, not much change. You had very basic service and inefficient operations. And it was pretty much stuck in that position. And the main solution for back then, I guess, was pipelining, was considered a, obviously a Rolls-Royce type solution. But in, for most cases, it's just too expensive. And so that gave the right environment for canal automation to be you know, considered and piloted and, and to and that generate, you know, it's advanced a lot in those 20 years to where it is now. And what it's achieved is broken up that tension between service and efficiency. So rather than having trading them off, both of them improve. So they now provide very high service levels and you can run the systems very efficiently. So by and large, stopping the spills at the end of systems. The other one, just from a planning point of view, and what I particularly like is they're very scalable. Um, so you don't have to automate all of your system. Um, and in a lot of cases, it probably doesn't make sense to automate all your system. In, in the Australian environment, we have really large customers. So um, out automating the outlets does make sense. But if you've got small, lots and lots of small customers, probably automating outlets is not gonna make sense. So the scalability, you can start out from a really basic level uh, and just put in measurement on your main canal and start measuring all your outfalls. And that's well, the project we did uh, in the McAllister Irrigation District. That was the starting point. And one of the reasons <coughs> is that um, under manual systems, it's really hard to know where your water is because the measurement's so poor and so scarce. The only part of your system is measurement. And there's very few recordings and the those recordings might be once a day when the system varies uh, quite significantly over a whole day. So a pre-project situation on where's my water going is a really hard question to answer. So after you've got your measurement in place, you can do your main canal and that brings this um, high level of service through your main distribution network. And then it brings a whole lot of equity right through your system. You can go further into subsystems and if you want to, and then in some cases it's going to be justified, you can do your outlets as well. And that's that full system. So there's lots and lots of choices you can make here. The other one is it logistically does take a while to implement. So uh, building in stages is a practicality issue. And also it's the way it's designed, you can actually just stop. So you can, in a lot of the systems we've had, um, part of the system's automated, part remains in manual. And that's, that's a workable solution. It may not be ideal, but that gives you that flexibility. You're not locked into finishing everything. It does give you a whole lot of choice. Uh, this slide here is just putting in, I guess, in Australia, channel automation has always been retrofitted on top of a channel system. So these channels are <clears throat> built back in 1920s, 1950s, so they're quite old. 
Um, and the important thing here is that the underlying features of the channel don't change. So the capacity of the channels stay the same. Where your regulators are, typically those sites are just retained. You don't put in new regulators. You just keep where those existing regulators are. Um, <clears throat> travel time. So if a channel's particularly flat, it's going to remain particularly flat. And if it's got seepage and, and uh, leakage losses, those things don't change. So that's an important consideration. In some cases, it made sense that some of the channels were pretty old and in poor condition. And if that's the case, uh, channel automation is not going to fix an old system and, and piping may be a better solution if your assets are in really poor condition. So on top of that channel system, you, in comes the uh, new technology and those gates sit inside existing regulators. So those sites were just adapted, <coughs> modified, but the main concrete in asset remains unchanged and the gates have got their own system. They fit in with their own guides and then the gate sits inside them, which makes it um, very relatively easy and, and takes away one of those big costs, which is building civil assets. So once that's in place, you can create your service benefits. So with that service <coughs> system orderings, because the customer has to order, ordering is very important. So that changes a lot. And I've got some slides and I won't go into too much detail here because the next slides have got some numbers and more commentary, but it certainly increases massively improved uh, ordering. So it's a much more convenient. It gives really good flow supply. So uh, people can rely on the water levels and then I, and if you, in some cases you can put in the order automated outlets and that's, if you've got those in as well, you've got the full solution and, and you can get some really great outcomes because those outlets control themselves in terms of they operate in flow control. And as the channel moves up and down slightly or the on-farm levels change, those gates can move around and adapt to keep really reliable flow rates. And that's been really critical in getting uh, good on-farm performance. So if you've got very good um, flow rates onto the farm, and in a lot of cases, we can get the flow rate up to a higher level as well. They can really have massive jumps and on farm, not only efficiency, they use a lot less water, but also the effectiveness, the crop health is a lot better. So, all that upside of that, the service improves, reduce the out, uh, reduce losses. So, the main loss is what we call outfall losses or spills, which is the water which you spill at the end of a system, and that's Inevitably, you can't run a manual system without spilling water at the bottom. It's just, it's impossible to do that. Um, it doesn't change the base losses. So you don't change the seepage and leakage or evaporation. Um, but what you do know is you start to know where it is. You can actually, because it's measurement right throughout the system, you can start finding out where your seepage and leakage losses are. And that makes a big difference. Plus, and I guess this is the big one, is uncertainty gets disappeared. Um, a typical water balance before these projects is you'd have so many deliveries, you'd have an estimate of outfalls, you can estimate evaporation reasonably well, um, some estimate of seepage leakage, and then there used to be a big chunk of, well, I don't really know what this, where the rest of this water goes. So that uncertainty we used to have in water balance studies under manual control disappears when you've got channel automation in, in, in place. Just me on the next this slide here is, um, so what sort of benefits can you get? So the delivery efficiency, uh, typically for of our systems was somewhere in the range of 60, 70 was typical. And then after channel automation, you can get them up from 80 to 95. And the 95 is a really, it's not many achieve that. And that's an exceptionally high number. And I guess one of the reasons that's possible in Australia is we have really old soils and so a lot of, heavy clay. So our seepage and leakage in some areas is very low, uh, very, very low in some clay, clay areas. So you're really only losing uh, evaporation and a lot of our evaporation losses, because we deliver large amounts of water, uh, the, as a percentage evaporation losses might be only you know, two to 4%. The service, as I mentioned, is a big change. Um, and the other one is data. In terms of um, 
you start to get measurement data, you start to get water level data, which is not even recorded on a manual control. So you, you start to actually understand how the system works. You actually understand what channel capacities are. And one of the things is some channel capacities physically had to be adopted, adopted, <coughs> adjusted because the old capacity, which was assumed, was never actually achieved in some cases, or conversely, in some cases, there was more capacity than people thought. And, that, and that's really been important, this measurement, accurate measurement, because if you can't measure it accurately, it does limit your, your management to a lot, to a large degree. Those couple of graphs I'm showing on this slide, that these are sort of summarised information that comes out of the, the uh, data system. So this is daily averages our whole season. So that top green line is what the system's trying to do is provide stable water levels. So this is a, a site where the, the water levels over the whole year. The other line below that's the downstream water level. And the bottom line just shows you the flow variations. So it because customers um, place the orders, it, it, the demand profile varies a lot. And that makes control fairly challenging in manual and automation. But that just highlights the variability we have in demand because that's made by customers. The Water Authority doesn't provide any water unless it's ordered. So just looking at that comparison, looking at those couple of features between manual and automated. So under manual control, customers place the order for consideration. They place it in the system and what we call a planner would look at those orders. Um, so the customer has to place it four days in advance um, the planners would co collate all those orders and then they would tell the customer one day before the delivery, um, this is when you're starting. In an automated system, they just place the order online on computer or via a mobile and it's just, it's in the system straight away. The only time it doesn't get accepted is if there's lack of capacity. So <laughs> in the peak of summer on some channels, um, capacity can be reached. So the customer can see that and they can then see the options they can irrigate earlier or they can irrigate later. So the planning arranged under manual control is that um, once all those orders have been placed in the system, under manual control, you just aim for one regulation a day. So you're aiming for a morning regulation on the main channels um, and all the orders are moved forwards or backwards to fit in with this one big change. Uh, under manual control, if you're trying to do more than that, the system becomes too hard to manage. So under automation, um, you, don't, you don't do anything. The, the system actually runs itself. So the channel runs itself. You don't have to plan that. The, the system looks after itself. Having said that, the people that oversee the system can go in at anywhere, any point in time, any place and work out what's happening. They can see what the demand is, what the, what the actual current flow rate is. So it's all available, the information is available there, but they don't actually do it. The system actually does all the, effectively does the planning. So that regulations I mentioned before, the manual control, you just do a, a really major one single regulation in the morning. And then you try to do minor adjustments the rest of the day to keep it uh, level. And you, uh, when one, the idea during the day is that when one customer finishes, a nearby customer starts straight away, so there's not too much change in demand. And you, <clears throat> and it's really daytime skewed. So you, you just try to not do much overnight, which makes sense. Farmers don't really want to change things overnight. Plan, um, planners and operators don't want to change things overnight. So it's all set up at night time that, uh, Nothing happens till the next morning. Conversely, with the channel automation, it just day or night, the actual operation doesn't change at all. So the regulators, if you go out the site, can be underwhelming in terms of there's no, no um, obvious action a lot of the time. So every minute it considers whether it needs to move. Um, and if it does need to move, the motor starts up, and the gate moves, but it might only move five millimetres and it stops. And then it now considers the next change another minute later. So that, that type of very frequent operation with minor adjustments is, is the nature of channel automation. And that it evens time slide there. 
where those controls are being done, considered on at least every minute's time scale is vastly different from the manual control. We only do it once a day and then to do some minor adjustments after that. Water levels, I guess under manual control, water levels was never really a thing. The operators would check the water level when they're doing the regulation and adjust up or down in a fairly crude way. So the, the typical drop bar regulator had big timber boards. They're 100 mil thick. So that's the level coarseness of the regulation. So 100 mil is the minimum change you can make. Conversely, with the gates, uh, they move within a millimetre. So it's far, you know, 100 times more accurate straight away. And it records that water level. Um, so it records it, it can be every minute on, on, on the site, but actually samples much more frequently because the water level, water levels are so crucial. The actual device samples every couple of seconds, averages it over a minute and you get the average. Um, now, all that information not necessarily passed back to central control. It could be if you wanted to, but it's still too much. So by and large, you don't need that information. So you might typically just set it up so you get a reading every hour or you can set it up for threshold. So if it changes by more a certain amount, it'll send a message back. And so you know it's, it's changing. The other one, the big, where we're losing, where manual systems lose a lot of water is these spills at the end or an outfall. So typically, <clears throat> under manual control, a person might measure that once a day. And a lot of the sites actually weren't measured. The operator would estimate how much might have got down there. So the number was always very poor and, and typically grossly underestimated. So once you put it out, falls in there, uh, and this is a key point for channel automation because they're justified on channel water savings. This is the benchmark, if you like, to justify projects. They're continuously measured. So it's the same technology. So continuous measurement over the whole season. Uh, and what we found is that the pre-project estimates uh, were grossly under, underestimating. Um, the other one is just general water flow measurements. So at a few key sites in manual control, you might record it off takes. Some major regulators would have recordings, but otherwise, you don't record it, it's up to the operator to adjust their flows, they did that, but there's no record of what happened. So once you've got channel automation, you've just got measurement everywhere um, across the whole system. So it's sort of, plus it records all its input. So when it records a flow, it needs to know upstream, downstream water level, where the gate is, and all those inputs are also measured. So the flume gates themselves, can have problems sometimes if the if it, the water level, what we call drown out, the upstream downstream level is effectively the same. The measurement for that device will it's outside, it's fit for range purpose. There is another gate uh, that we can provide that overcomes that issue. The slip gate has got a different measurement technique, but you've also if you can drill into it, you can actually find out all the inputs for your measurement as well. So just the performance changes as mentioned before. Customs had to order four days in advance. After you have a change from manual to automation, they only have to do one day. Uh, under manual, because we only, they only really want to do one regulation day, most orders were shifted. So typically that would range somewhere between four to eight hours, most orders shifted by that amount. Um, with automation, the order doesn't shift, it's just, it's automated. So it's right on time, unless it's a capacity problem. Flow rate reliability wasn't, it's not measured with manual systems because they, they don't have anything to measure flow reliability. So there are some small number of tests when we looked at that and some, they typically range from <clears throat> plus or minus 5% if you're on a main channel up near the top. Uh, but if you're somewhere else, they can be varying by plus or minus 25%. And that really causes on-farm problems because that variability in leads to really poor on-farm outcomes. The outlet operation under manual control it was the customer opened and closed their outlet. Uh, it was, they had to do it at the time they ordered, which by and large did happen, but not always. Um, with channel automation, if you have an app, automated outlet, 
it's automated, but there are systems, uh, the Southern Raw Water one, a lot of the outlets are still manually controlled. So the manual outlets interface quite successfully with an automated canal system. So the management, uh, the measurement, so with the manual control, the, it's a common device had in Australia called a death ridge outlet. So on average, it under-recorded by 8.6%. 8, 8 they did some testing on that. But on top of that, it varied a lot. So some outlets might under-record by 20%. Some outlets actually recorded correctly. So there's a whole lot of variation, a lot of big variations in it. So there's a lot of equity issues. People got different amounts of water. Well, the flume gates pretty much been a lot of flow testing on those. So plus or minus 5% is, is what you expect from a flume gate. So the equity in a manual system, if you had a farm, you always wanted to be near the, the top of the system. Uh, I grew up on a farm and we were near the top of the system. It was a great place to be because you got the best flows. Uh, but if you're at the bottom end of a manually controlled large irrigation system, you generally always got pretty poor service. Um, very poor because it's very hard. By the end of the system, the control is degraded as you moved on. Uh, system outfall losses, so under manual control, typically in the range of 10 to 20% would be spilt. Um, and with channel automation, whatever that starting volume is, you can eliminate 80 to 95%. And a lot of the part of the season, there is no outfall. Um, channel base losses, so the um, seepage and leakage evaporation remains the same. Only with automation, you, you get a better idea what those numbers are. Uh, the data, there's very not much data. I mean, manually controlled systems would end up typically in a spreadsheet of some sort, um, and you'd have a number. You're not really sure where that number came from, had it been typed in correctly even. Uh, but there's very little information there. Whereas if you go to automation, it, it's a vast amount of information. It's, it's an incredible amount. And so the water balance pre-projects and the manual control was always very uncertain. Um, and once you got into automation, particularly once you've done a whole system or subsystem in that area, you've got really good understanding of what your water, water balance is. So these, the, Challenges of implementing these projects, um, the nature of the how channels behave is, is fundamentally different. Um, and that takes a while for people to get used to. Um, took a while for me, it took a while for operators, because used to this one big regulation and then trying to adjust it to this continual change and fluctuations, you know, very frequent very small changes to flows all the time. It's, it's quite a different system. So uh, it's it's not automating, the automation is not replicating manual control. It's a fundamentally different one. It's a different time scale. As Eva mentioned in these slides, so it's very different. In terms of these projects in Australia, the main justification for them was to save water. So um, having a pre-project estimate of water losses was, was difficult because measurement was poor, there wasn't a lot of it. And um, on top of that, it was uncertain actually where some of those water losses went. And also the, these projects, when they're proposed, people, some people obviously take advantage of water losses. So they're not really in favour of a system that eliminates water losses. So that's just one of the political issues you need to manage in these projects. The other one is probably, they're very multidisciplinary projects. So they do involve civil works and works putting in the gates, but a lot of ways um, that's a logistic challenge, but it's the easiest part of the project. Um, it's a whole lot of technology. So there's a whole lot of new technology and people not only have to implement that correctly, but people using it have to get trained in how to operate that. It's a big change for everyone. So it's a big change for the operators, the customers. I'd say there's a lot of consultation required with these projects because the way people order water, the way they receive water is, is all changed. So they have to be explained what's that going to look like uh, before the project starts. And the, probably the, the biggest 
is the business transformation. So fundamentally your organisation uh, in that operations area fundamentally changes. So a lot of roles disappear and a lot of new ones are created. People have required different skills. So, and, and then, especially as you're doing a stage project, you've got to keep on adjusting because you've got a bit of, bit of manual, a bit of automation, how do you blend these together? And that's quite a challenge to, to manage on your way through the project. And the other one in the delivery stage, because this is a multidisciplinary project, <laughs> um, if you've got a governance structure overlooking your project delivery and if they're just used to a civil type project, um, they're going to struggle to provide the right sort of guidance for a multidisciplinary project because there's lots of other non-civil aspects of the project to make this successful. And if, if you don't think those through and, and support the project, you will run into some problems. The other one, the asset requirements. So my most irrigation channel systems, the asset management is, um, I guess, simple compared to an urban environment, urban environment where you've got lots of mechanical, electrical um, treatment type devices. Uh, at the, in terms of asset management, most manual canal systems are pretty basic. You mean not very complex structures and there's not many moving parts. But once you put in channel automation, you've got lots of technology, you've got lots of uh, electrical mechanical gear. And so you need to have an asset management uh, approach which is suitable to that environment. So it's much more like having a car. You've got to have regular servicing, checking, you've got to be able to do diagnostics. So all those sort of asset management skills to suit the technology have to be brought in. And there's a challenge from a water service provider is what's the right mix of internal, external skills. Um, some of this gear is really complex. Um, does it make sense to to develop those skills in-house or do you rely on a third party? So radio comms is another one that that's quite a specialist area. So in most cases, water service providers would probably rely on a, an external specialist for that sort of service. But they're sort of decisions you've got to think your way through and pick out what's the right approach for your own organisation. And the other one is just huge amount of data. So uh, early on, you can be swamped just going from virtually no data to just an amazing amount of data um, is, is challenging. And one of the issues there is um, setting alarms. So with automation, you can alarm everything you want. You can put alarms on flows, water levels, upstream, downstream, whatever you want. And the temptation and common practice is, is to start out alarming everything, which tends to uh, overwhelm anyone operating the system. So there's a bit of learning process that is what do we really need to alarm? Um, there's lots of flexibility, but you don't, <laughs> don't need to use that flexibility all the time. So that, that's a type of issues that um, you need to think through, which are quite unique to channel automation because it just creates so much data. What's important? What do I need to monitor? What's, what's a high level? What's a low level? You've got to make all these decisions. And that once they're configured, it's a learning process. You, you can sort of manage the system. Now, the other thing I suppose in the Australian experience is even though these roles have changed, uh, it's very different to what was in the past, by and large, the same staff have ended up, they used to do manual control, now do automation. So even though it's a complex system underneath, um, it's quite relatively straightforward to use once people have had training. So you can see the photos there of some of that you know, on, on screens that people have to get used to. You'll have field technicians who can go out, service devices, make sure they work. So that, by and large, um, it's been able to use existing staff to adopt these new roles, which has been good. Uh, and that helped a lot. If, it, if the situation was you had to have brand new staff and everyone was left, it would have made it a much, much more difficult project. So that's covered at all from my point of view, Carl. Okay, thank, thanks, thanks, Paul. And um, it's it's interesting when you when you think about the transformation of the irrigation of the irrigation regions and what it means for the people in it is um, it's been significant. And uh, I think that's been one of the biggest learnings in Australia is dealing with 
lots and lots of customers and their expectations. But it's multidisciplinary is a good way to describe it. Um, so uh, if you stop sharing your screen, uh, happy to take a question for you. It's been, well, perhaps we'll just go straight into a panel because I think a couple of those have been responded. Would you would respond to those anyway, if you like? Um, so my screen still on, is it? Uh, yep. Um, better. Yep. Uh, no, still on. Uh. There you go. We'll get. There you go. You're off. Um, so we might just do one, um, and I think for you, and then we. I'll just share a screen here and then um, we might just take one question. But just uh, want to thank the panellists to start with because you've been diligently responding to questions as they've been popping through and we're, we're, we're down down on now only to 12. So we'll have a very brief Q&A session. Um, and I will note that Ivan uh, had to depart. He had to go to another meeting, which uh, in Australia time, it's now 10 to 12 midnight. Um, so I'm not sure what other meeting Ivan is off to at 10 to 12 at night, but that's, uh, that's the world we live in. Um, so one, the question I have there, Paul, for you is, is reliability of the fully automated canal system. What if a control system fails at one spot and then how does it adjust to regulate for that loss, which I, I think we've experienced lots of that. Yeah, so that, I guess the technology's uh, 15 to 20 years old now. Uh, in terms of, so it's gone through quite a development phase. So the underlying technology um, is, is very reliable. Um, so do gates fail? That's certainly possible. Um, so that that's alarmed. So you know that straight away. So if it's a single gate in a regulator, um, you would have to go out and someone would have to actually adjust it on site. So it got stuck in the wrong position. But if it's multiple gate, the other gates can actually take all the flow. And so you said certainly... Um, Reliable, so it's not a big issue in modern situations. It doesn't happen that often. Um, so the gates, because they don't, as I mentioned before, they only move small amounts. So it, it's I know Damien might have better statistics on number of gates which have um, caused problems or had to be replaced, but by and large it's pretty rare for a gate to fail. Okay. Thank you. Um, so just before I throw to a couple of the questions, and there's a couple we probably, I think probably is only one or two we're going to have time to. We've gone a bit over our time of, I thought, about an hour and a half. We've been about an hour and 45. Um, but just before I do that, I might just, uh, Brian Wood would, uh, would growl at me if I didn't. Um, uh, if... Does that pop up? I think your screen sharing. I think uh, you should be seeing a slide of the um, of yeah, the uh, ICID right. conference. Yes. Yep. ICID conference slide. Yep. Yep. So this it's basically it's a, a, a blatant promotion of uh, the ICID conference in Adelaide next year in twenty twenty two. Um, it's been deferred twice, uh, so now it's. Uh, I just would like to uh, suggest that uh, any of the people on the screen or involved in this uh, webinar, if you'd like to come to Australia intellectually, you'll see a few of the things we've been talking about um, tonight or today. Um, that automated irrigation system and the GMID, uh, Southern Rural Water, uh, the various areas in in, um, in Australia that have adopted this, and New South Wales as well. And some of that on-farm automation but that is able to happen as a result of the modernised system, I think. Uh, if you'd like to be there, that would be fantastic in October. Uh, it's changed a couple of times, but um, I look forward to seeing you in Adelaide if uh, if you can make your way there. And uh, subject to COVID restrictions, we should be should be fine. But uh, hopefully, everyone is coping with that. Um, so I think the one question that's popped up a few times, gentlemen, uh, and is is around the cost of the of, of the system and the cost share and whether it is uh, who pays the cost up front for the modernisation and then who pays the ongoing cost of looking after that. Um, so perhaps it's Paul, maybe, or Damien. 
I know the answers, but I don't want to answer any questions, so I'm up to you guys. Um, so the, these projects, by and large, uh, the government's paid the bulk of the capital, um, but the water authorities have to keep on paying the, the cost to operate and maintain the system, and that operation and maintenance cost is fully funded by customers. So the government even though they're funded in exchange, they've taken the water savings by and large. So those water savings, particularly in say, the Northern Victorian project, have been then transferred across to the rivers. So there's more, more flow in the river system. So that's the exchange. So the government would invest in uh, channel automation to save water, and that save water then end up being the rivers. In terms of water pricing, uh, customers have their own... Um, share of water, uh, so they get a, a share, and each, each customer has a different share. And that was originally set on their size of the property at the time. In Australia, those property, um, land property and water property are now separate. So people just have water shares. And then they have to pay a, a fee per megalitre each year for, those, for that water. And that pricing, uh, is set by the water authorities. It's overseen by uh, regulators, <clears throat> but that covers the cost of all the cost to operate the system, cost to maintain the system, and the cost to renew the assets. Yeah, which which works which works well. What works in Australia, where we we measure weigh and count all, all water, and then that, the use of that water is applied to the people who use it. Really, that, that's the basis for the system. Um, the other, the other one there, I think, is worth um, looking at a little bit. Probably, Damien, in your perspective, is that the cost, the costs of some of these. So, just an example, cost of some of the gates and some of the, the meters, and and what that might look like from maybe US is might be easiest. Yeah, it's uh, this question of cost has come up in a few uh, uh, questions tonight. Um, so it. it you can appreciate there's a lot of different sizes of flow rates and it, yeah. Um, so on an individual unit basis, um, you might be looking at a small gate or meter being on the range of say um, 8,000 to 10,000 US dollars. And it goes up from there. Um, but when we're talking about systems, it's uh, probably more instructive to look at the, the, the cost per hectare. Um, and uh, Look, it's best approach to answer that question is to actually do a, a system appraisal. <laughs> um, you know, we can then you know, do a survey of a system and uh, Rubicon actually uh, commonly does that at no cost uh, to, to basically size a system and come up with an estimate. But uh, look, for, for the irrigation programs in a, or modernisation projects in Australia, in Australian dollars, we, we've, we've generally seen the big systems implemented at around five hundred to a thousand dollars per hectare for the canal automation work, and that sort of relates uh, to equivalent on-farm um, investments. So maybe uh, pressurised systems on farm, you might be looking at a thousand to five thousand dollars per hectare. So uh, five hundred to a thousand off-farm, a thousand to five thousand on-farm. Um, so it, it 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 actually works out to be quite yeah very cost effective when you look at the value of the water that's recovered. And just on top of that, that's the full system. We can just put in doing the mains channels, which obviously mm. that reduces your cost a lot. Uh, mm. You don't get quite the service outcome, but you get still get, you get a lot of the, most of your water savings that way. That's a really good point. And Paul, I think you mentioned in your presentation that you don't have to do it all at once. You can do it in incremental steps and get a feel for the returns on the initial investments and then, yeah, learn from that experience to expand in, into the future in an in a ongoing program. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dan Lou, there's, there's one there about um, the next step from your work around um, forty. so it's hydrological at the moment, um, yeah, looking sure. at the plant, the plant return as part of the next stage. Is that, that's what you're working on now, I believe? Oh, sorry, could you repeat that? The plant return? Ah, so, so you've got the, the plant, the, it says here anthropogenic, uh, but in the end it's really plant growth as an aspect yep. of, of your work. Yep. Um, but yeah. also, um, I guess the water waste is probably 
um, that's not too much. Well, that's somehow related to plant because we don't want to over waterlog the plant. But it's um, for our from our design, it's more about the cost of wasting water. So, yeah, I think we're actually considering some anthropogenic factors here. Yeah. Okay. Um, and there was one one there about uh, maintenance of the system and uh, and uh, do we have issues in Australia with vandalism and and uh, etc. And yeah, one of one of the challenges I think is is we would say people like to take the solar batteries away and the solar panels away and that, that's a replacement, but it's built into that operation and maintenance cost and, and it's probably less so now, I think, Damien or, or Paul. Yeah, um, keen for Paul's perspective, but the, the, the vandalism and theft rates in the world are surprisingly low. Um, and I think a lot of that is, uh, well, there's real time feedback. As soon as anyone unplugs a solar panel or does something like that, then we get an immediate alert. And uh, you know, the, the district or, uh, authorities can be on site pretty quickly. I also think that you know the, the beneficiaries of the equipment adopt a bit of a neighbourhood watch mentality. You know, if if, um, if the equipment's interrupted, it, in, it basically impacts their service. So, um, for a range of reasons, including those, no, the vandalism it, it's not actually a, a huge problem. Paul, keen for your perspective on that? Yeah, look, uh, same thing. There was a, a a small number of cases of uh, people removing solar panels, but that was the design. I remember the mask was changed that made it fairly difficult to do. Um, and um, the other point that Damien put up, I mean, when these systems were put in, customers were a bit uh, hesitant. They weren't a bit unsure whether they'd be beneficial or not, but a lot of the people actually love the system. So they are, are very keen to protect it and make sure it's working. So I, I'm not, you don't hear of many cases overall of vandalism to the system. Okay, um, and and one maybe it's one last one which I'll get the answer I suppose. So when uh, irrigation automation is downstream river biota considered, and um, and yes, we all know construction of dams changes the flow profile of the river and streams, uh, and really in Australia that that's where we probably dreamed up water for the environment and allowing enough through flow to protect the environment that we identify as part of the process now wasn't so much early on but it's now clearly on the radar for, for um, uh, identifying uh, water for the environment and ensuring we protect the downstream as, as part of the process and, and that's probably the big step that we've taken and under the basin plan and, uh, and looking at protecting the environment as part of our automation and, and modernisation of the systems it's, that's really what's driven a lot of it and so um, sorry, my dog has come into my room. Um, um, so I think perhaps it's time to finish up. We've 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 used two hours. Um, I, I I would uh, I think there's a, a few questions in here still. We, we'll take those on notice. I think and and um, we'll answer a few directly. Uh, type in the responses. I think Harish, we are. Um, We'll be record, sharing the recording of this session uh, to everyone in attendance. Yeah, we'll be uh, putting the recording of uh, this entire presentation, entire webinar yeah. on our website. We are trying to download all the questions along with the answers. That also we'll try to put up uh, on uh, our website along with the recording and the okay. presentations also. Uh, yeah. I'll request uh, our president, Dr. Raghav, to say a few words before we uh, end this webinar. Okay, thank you, thank you. And, and, and thank you everyone for your time and, and attendance. I think 268 was the peak number, uh, which is not too bad, really. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers for such wonderful presentations and, and a very uh, uh, comprehensive coverage of the automation and modernization of the irrigation systems. Uh, really, there are so many messages to take home. And what strikes me is the distribution efficiency to increase to almost 95%, the delivery also efficiency between 85 and 95%, and the control of the water from the dam to the farm on demand. So the supplier really is provided on demand 
which is something really that's very important. Uh, also, the, the risk uh, of under irrigation and the risk of over irrigation uh, and also the seasonal risk uh, due to the rainfall forecast uh, and how that's important in decision making. I think it's really a very uh, important uh, uh, message for people to, to look into uh, how much risk actually associated with the manual, the non-automated and non-modernized non uh, irrigation system. Uh, also, the, the, the catchment uh, uh, scale, how it is important for water management, as Ivan mentioned, it's really water management really has to go with the, with the larger scale than the field scale, which is the, the catchment scale, and also how important is the spatial and temporal scale as, as also highlighted by, by, um, by Ivan. Uh, it is really quite uh, uh, impressive uh, to see how the AG Tech software controls actually the whole system and how it is really important to reduce the, the water, uh, water losses. Uh, and and, and uh, there are so many really things if I, if I, I look at uh, my, my notes here, uh, is really um, the benefits of having uh, more reliability and with the system. So you have more reliable system, you have more consistent system uh, with uh, automation and modernization. Uh, and also you have equitable distribution. Uh, and, and that also the, the idea of having a water bank is really very striking. It's a very nice idea to have a water bank and it is really uh, something that uh, should be really widely uh, uh, applied because that's really important for distributed and limited water uh, resources. Um, and I just uh, going through what really I, I wrote here, the uncertainty mentioned in several times. And, and also I, I, I should say I published a paper last year about uncertainty analysis for river flows. And I could, I could see the uncertainty level goes down when you increase the time scale. And I, I have no idea how that would, would work with the smaller scale, but I used the glue um, uh, algorithm developed by Keith Bevan. And I applied that on river flows on seven catchments across the UK. And I, I could see the uncertainty level goes down when you use annual flows rather than daily or monthly. But how that would work really with your system, uh, uh, especially when it comes to field scale and forecast of the rainfall and the ET is another issue. Uh, I also uh, discovered the from my work in north of Italy in irrigation scheduling, especially using the FAO 56 uh, for semi-arid and arid regions, it overestimates the crop water requirements. And I would imagine this is, would be the case for Australia. And that's maybe need to be revisited uh, because the, 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 what the, the papers I published in irrigation and drainage uh, uh, last year or so, uh, shows that there is overestimation for arid regions or semi-arid regions of the crop water requirements when you use AT-56, uh, uh, FO-56. Mm -hmm. Lining of canals is, I, I can of course understand the lining of canals is because you are Im improving the performance of old initial canals. But I wonder if it's in the future in, in Australia are you going to uh, transport water through pipelines uh, instead of open canals? And I can imagine, of course, if you have already uh, open uh, canals and uh, instead of really, uh, uh, yeah, not uh, converting them into pipe, might be cheaper to line them and, and use them. But I wonder if in the future or a new project, considering and for new irrigated areas uh, to, uh, to use pipelines where you could reduce the evapotranspiration losses uh, from open canals. Uh, soil moisture sensors and 
uh, uh, and ET. I, I also uh, am aware that one uh, a soul motion could be used for soul motion deficit. And that's on its own is enough to calculate how much water to apply. And I was wondering why we need to calculate the AT and soil moisture deficit. Uh, are we, do we need both? And, and how actually these uh, two uh, can be closer or far from each other in terms of crop water requirements. Uh, but there are so many really um, uh, very important messages, especially the economic benefits and the cost, because everyone will talk about the cost because it's heavily instrumented uh, automation and modernization. But I'm sure that the, the recovery of the cost will not take long, given the amount of water would be saved uh, with high efficiency of 95, uh, 85%. The other point also I noticed that maybe, uh, maybe I missed is the selection of the irrigation system. Uh, would it be uh, uh, available for the farmer uh, that sort of knowledge to tell the farmer was the best irrigation system for him or for her to use uh, to improve the, the water use efficiency and water productivity. Uh, I'm not really sure if the model or the, uh, the agri tech would actually provide that sort of uh, information to the farmer who is looking for a better irrigation uh, system. You have AP SIM and you have uh, AG tech one of them perhaps should provide the farmer with information about what's the best actually um, uh, uh, irrigation system and what's the best crop as well. Because if you have a limited amount of water, you might not like to go for uh, a water consuming crop. You might go for uh, a less water consuming crop. And yeah, there are so many really things that um, you, you can discuss but uh, all in all, really, it's very uh, comprehensive coverage. And it shows how important um, uh, for all of us to, to use the water wisely, using automation and modernization, because the irrigation efficiency in terms of delivery and uh, convenience uh, is really not questionable. It's too high, 95%. And with the limited water resources, uh, that we have now, and with that limited amount, we're supposed to double the food production by 2050. And I think automation and modernization is the way forward. And thank you very much for all of the speakers, uh, Ivan, Damian, uh, Paul, and Danlo, for really uh, bringing this issue to us and to enlighten us and to enrich our knowledge with something new. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope that we'll meet each other in. Adelaide next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, Thank Mr. You. Brian, Thank you. would you like to say something? Thank you, Harish. Now I'd just like to also extend our thanks to the speakers as well. It's, uh, it's after midnight here in Australia and uh, they've done a remarkable job of uh, looking like they're awake and fresh and uh, answering all the questions in the Q&A. So, uh, on behalf of Irrigation Australia, I'd just like to extend our, our thanks to the speakers and also to, uh, to ICID for making this platform available. And uh, as uh, President Brigab just said, we would like to see you all in Adelaide uh, next year. So uh, thank you very much and good night. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank, thank you. you. In the oh, end, uh, yeah, end, I just uh, thank uh, uh, our President, Dr. Raghav, who has joined us and given his valuable session. I thank all the speakers who have given this wonderful presentation um, and they are, they are still uh, there uh, in the midnight and then uh, still uh, more than 200 participants are uh, uh, joining join. and uh, we received uh, more than 50 questions and out of that uh, more than 40 questions have been answered by all the speakers and this is very wonderful and then all the participants have participated very actively in the discussion and then in the webinar. So we thank all the participants who have joined this and who could not continue even uh, who could not continue till end, but we thank all the participants. Recording will be available in a day or two uh, along with uh, the questions and answers. Uh, and uh, in the end, I thank 
all the speakers, all the participants, and uh, Irrigation Australia for coordinating and organizing uh, this wonderful webinar. Uh, I thank Madhu also, who is uh, doing his job for recording and then uh, processing the video uh, recording and then putting on the website. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Uh, good Thank night. You. Good morning. Good, good evening. Night. Good 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 night. Thank you, Madhu. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank Take you care. Very much. Take you. you. Take I'll care. See you tomorrow. Thank you, sir. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, sir. Have a nice. Yeah. Have a nice day. See you tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sir.